Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. I'm Ryan Clark, joined by Chris Reifer. It is Thorns Game Week, ladies and gentlemen. First game of the season coming up Saturday for the Thorns against uh, the Kansas City Current. Um, regular season kicking off there at CPKC Stadium. The debut of that new first of its kind women's soccer specific stadium uh, over in KC and the Thor yeah it looks, looks super, super cool, cool and the Thornies are going to be there so it's, it's going to be a, a fun day for sure to get the season rolling um, obviously several Thorns players coming off of the, the Gold Cup and everything else so we'll get more into that as the podcast gets rolling but um, we will begin today's podcast by talking about the Portland Timbers who um headed over to Yankee Stadium in New York and uh, were down one zip, seemed like things weren't going terribly well for them. And then Anthony continued his incredible play through these first three games, scores the tying goal, and of course the highlight of, of the day and, and probably of the week of games for MLS um, was Evander's late goal in, in stoppage time, a walk-off walk bomb. bomb. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton would be proud of the of the bomb That's that right. uh, Evander Golazzo is, is his full name now, by the way, just in case people were con- yeah, confused. So the AI comments. articles are already calling him <laughs> uh, Evander Golazzo. Uh, and that it was a Golazzo. It was an amazing, amazing moment for Evander, potentially the highlight of his Timbers career so far. Um, and, and kept... Phil Neville's tricky Timbies uh, undefeated as the season continues to roll on uh, and and something that is starting to become a, a compelling sort of stretch here for, for the Timbers if they can keep this going. Um, that They're playing hard, they're playing with belief, um, and, and you read a lot of what other people have written um, about this team, uh, even the NYCFC people, they, they were talking about how like Diego Chara at 37 years old was the guy that was, you know, busting his butt and playing the hardest of anybody on the field. Now that's been a trend for, for years for that guy. Um, many years, but, uh, but, but for that to be the case and, and for him to be setting the tone and the team to be following that sort of example, to, to stick with it in this way, when in previous years, they might've flopped in the situation that they were in. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about what that performance means for, for this team. And um, what an awesome moment for Evander. Great goal. Great time. for yeah. goal. <laughs> uh, Super fun. All, all of those things. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was, it was, that's, that's $10 million. That's a $10 million quality hit, right? That's not the kind of hit that you're going to get from, uh, from somebody who you signed for, you know, less than that. Uh, probably not the kind of hit that you're going to get from somebody that you, you know, bring out of the college draft. Uh, that's, that's a $10 million hit. That's just that quality of player, uh, can make that kind of play. And, and Evander showed that he's that quality of player. Now the Timbers need more, more consistently from him. I actually thought Evander did a really good job of finding that game. He was nowhere to be found in the first half hour or 40 minutes of the game. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do in a game in which you're overrun a little bit and having a little bit of difficulty sort of getting, getting your foot on the ball. He found the game. He found those spots. And actually that spot that he hit, that, that he had that $10 million hit from is a spot that he was finding repeatedly in the second half. That wasn't an accident. He had been hunting that space. Uh, and he had found it and he'd found it a, an area in which he'd like to operate against NYCFC. And in the end operate, he did. Uh, and so that's, uh, I mean, that's exactly what you want to be able to have a Vander to do. And, 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 you know, talking about the team as a whole, one thing that I think we certainly see now that we did not consistently see over the course of the last couple of seasons is the buy-in, right? This team is bought in right now. Um, they are fighting, they are sticking in games. That would have been a really easy game. And frankly, I think over the course of the last couple of years, it probably would have been a game in which after getting frankly pumped for the first half hour, they would have thrown up their hands and said, not our day road game, East coast. Let's let, let's go visit the statue of Liberty boys. Um, we, you know, we're done. <laughs> uh, and, and cause they really did. They got crushed. Uh, in in the first half hour or so of the game, there was one team on the field. Uh, the Timbers couldn't yeah. keep the ball 
It was one-way traffic for NYCFC. They were creating chance after chance after chance. Timbers were a little bit lucky only to give up one. Uh, Maxime Crepo came up big a cu- uh, on a couple occasions yet again, uh, sort of kept them in the game. But just progressively, the Timbers found the game a little bit more. And there have been knives out sort of in the national media for Nick Cushing and NYCFC, and I totally get why. I mean, the the way they approached the last hour of that game, most of which they were up 1-0. But, I mean, in a game where they were just totally dominating, when they were sort of on the front foot, pressing the Timbers and being really disruptive defensively, they just let off. <laughs> That pressure disappeared. And I thought for a while that it was just sort of like a, hey, we can't play this way for 90 minutes, at the, especially at this stage of the season, which is a totally sensible and understandable thing. Oh, um, but it never came back. <laughs> like Usually if you're like, all right, now we're going to we're going to take our, our, our foot off the accelerator for a little bit, sort of to close the first half, then you're going to come back out of the locker room and be like, now we're going to reassert ourselves on the game. And, you know, try to get this to two or three and yeah, put it and away. Phil, Phil's boys were the ones that took the sort of took the advantage yeah. there and, and took over the game in that way. Right. Like they were the they were the ones that set the tone in the second half. Um, obviously, the announcers were giving them credit for that. But, you know, you could see it. Any any objective viewer could see that the Timbers, you know, took control from there. Yep. No question. And. Uh, and credit to them for that. Uh, they, they didn't give up on that game and they ended up getting not just one point, but the full three points out of it. Uh, so, you know, seven points through three games. That's very good. Uh, I think there are from a global perspective reasons that the Timbers should feel that they need to continue to progress, uh, in order to be able to sort of be fighting in that top four range. You know, I mean, let's be honest, the three teams that they beat were all non-playoff teams in 2023. It's hard to be a non-playoff team in MLS. Most teams make the playoffs. These were all bottom third of the table teams. Frankly, I think nobody would be surprised if they were bottom third of the table teams again. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I, I think there is a fairly straightforward case to make that the Timbers have been a little bit of flat track heroes. The Timbers are also third worst in the league in terms of expected goal differential. Uh, So, I mean, if you want to look for reasons, and frankly, the Timbers should be looking for reasons to think that in their current form, they're ripe for regression. They're there. They're not that hard to find. Yeah. And that's not to say that this is a, this is, you know, fool's gold or anything like that. It just means that they need to continue to progress if they want to sort of keep up this form. They've got a couple winnable games ahead of them. Uh, they, they go at, they go to Houston this week. Houston just got knocked out of the CONCACAF champions cup. Um, make sure I get the new name, right? Uh, the, the, Geo, uh, they just Geo got knocked out by Columbus. Just call it CONCA champions and made, yeah. CONCA champions. That's, I, I, I think more folks are adopting yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that, that phraseology, I, you know, that, that's the phraseology that's been used, I think, down in, in, uh, in Mexico and Latin America for a bit. Uh, I think because most people find CCC to be kind of clumsy. I'll, that's I'll another clumsy. C word. So CCCC. Oh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that Conca champions in, ends up being a, a, a bit more of a thing, but whatever, whatever you want to call it, they just got knocked out of it, uh, on Tuesday. So they're going to be on a little bit of short rest. And frankly, it's just a Houston team that's been struggling. No Ache Ache. Uh, he is still out with an injury. They've got a couple other absences that have been important. They still have got, uh, they, they've still got Karaskia. They, they've got a couple other guys that can hurt you. But this isn't the Houston team that really was, I, th- I thought, the best team in the Western Conference over the course of the last half of 2023. They haven't been that so far. And similarly, then, the, the following week in returning home, they've got the Philadelphia Union, who just got crushed at Pachuco last night. Uh, in Conca Champions, um, and and has also not been the team that we have been become accustomed to seeing uh, over the course of the last few years. I think the Union are going to be fine, and frankly, my hunch is the Dynamo are going to be fine in the end. But they're not playing great, and there are certainly opportunities uh, for the Timbers to go take some points that you probably wouldn't necessarily allocate to them on the form chart in the next couple of weeks. But they've got to continue to progress, right? Uh, and I think if there there are very clear reasons, and I and I think wouldn't be surprised and hope Phil Neville, frankly, is is raising these things with his guys. There are reasons to believe that that you know they need to continue to work hard and 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 
uh, and progress in order to keep getting these points because, frankly, from the prior performances, the reasons to think they won't. Look, I mean, you know, whenever they've been pressed, whether it's against NYC uh, FC or, or DC United, they've really struggled, really struggled. And, you know, not every team is going to let them off the hook the way NYC FC did. Yeah, that so, game just turned on a head I, in, in a way that like, you know, you talked about before that game, you talked a lot about the limitations of the Yankee Stadium field. Obviously, it's five yards thinner, um, same length, but doesn't look like it on TV. It's really interesting, like the the dimension changes and the way that the stadium looks on TV. It, it looks so much smaller, but uh, but it really I mean, the, the width yeah. difference does make a difference. And, and for the first like half hour, 40 of that game, you could totally see that the Timbers were not necessarily playing in the way that you need to in, in that type of field. And, and NYCFC was dictating the game. And so, yeah, you play a better team, you play a more prepared team than that NYCFC team was, you're going to have more, more trouble. And, and, you know, how does, does Phil Neville and company respond to that? How, how do they make the tactical adjustments necessary? Um, I, I, don't want to discredit them by any stretch. I think that, you know, them taking control of the game was their doing for sure. But at the same time, you know, they, they did get help from, from the opposition in, in that way, like allowing it to happen. And it, it was sort of that two way street. And those things yeah, are related are, yeah. too. And I mean, you, you can't just say, well, NYCFC stunk. So the Timbers no. won. I mean, th- those two yeah. things are related. <laughs> Part of the reason why the Timbers stunk in the first half of the, in, in the first half of that game is because NYCFC was pretty good, and part of the reason that NYCFC stunk in the in the second half of that game was because the Timbers yeah. were pretty good. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, the, 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 those two things are related. But you know, I I think it, it's important in these stretches not to fall in love with some early success. And I think Phil Neville's got some tools and some things to go back to his team and be like, Hey, we can't fall in love with this because if we do, it's going to be a very, very rude awakening here. In, in the yeah. Next and I, I think it's a welcome sight to regardless of the game state and of NYCFC's play that the second half was the positive one for the Timbers because those first couple of games of the season, you know, they were tremendous in the first halves, especially Colorado. That might be an aberration, but you know, Colorado and DC United, both of those first halves were excellent. And then the second half was when they sort of just, you know, fell off the wagon a little bit that it was pretty much the exact opposite in this game. Um, So, you know, Phil Neville, any coach would would likely be just saying something along the lines of, you know, we like to put together a full 90. That's a classic coachism. And it's true in their case. They need to sort of do that in the coming weeks. Obviously, Houston is next. Um, you know, there'll be some guys missing with international duty and everything makes it thin at the back. You talked to, on Twitter about like a, a throwback duo of, of Zach McGraw and Dario Zuberich, which will be a good one right, from, you know, throwing it back to the, you know, glorious 2022, 2023 yeah, era. But, but those guys are a good pairing to, to, to <laughs> in all fairness to, to both of them. Obviously, um, Zach has emerged as one of the most important players on the Timbers uh, and Dario. Well, he hasn't played a lot this season. You know, he's steady. So you're, you're lucky in that sense, but obviously losing a significant amount of your depth in, in Kamal Miller uh, and, and Miguel Araujo, both of which are going to be going to be gone. Um, and there's a new addition coming in. He he won't be here Saturday for, for the Houston game by any stretch, but uh, Jonathan Cabecito Rodriguez is coming to Portland. Um, reported transfer fee of around $5 million. I saw $4.8 million reported by, by credible sources. And so wherever it falls in that range, obviously that's, uh, that's $10 million less than they were willing to spend uh, in, in terms of getting a, a major DP in here um and and they they are bringing in a guy that although he's on slightly the wrong side of 30 uh is someone that is is a lethal goal scorer um former Liga MXC's MVP um and somebody that that can lead the way up top and and Phil Neville when he was talking about the type of player they want to bring in um you know they were talking about a guy that could carry the team on on his shoulders I think that's possible with a guy like Rodriguez. It, he he might not need to necessarily. He might be more of like a guy that plugs in and fits well with the players around him rather than sort of carrying the team on their shoulders. 
Um, but they were also targeting other people <laughs> with, the, with, with the pursuit here. Um, so, so that was, um, that, that was a big signing, obviously for the Timbers. This is a big moment for them to, to bring in a DP and a, and a guy that, um, you know, could have a really strong couple of years for them uh, and be a leading goal scorer, allow f- somebody like Felipe Mora, who, who I think has been really good when healthy, um, to step back into a bench role or even play alongside somebody like Cabecita um, and, and thrive. So it's, it's, it's a great signing for them, in my opinion. I, I think it's something that is going to inject further life into what's been a strong season for them so far. Yeah, I, I, I think the the way it worked out makes a decent amount of sense, especially if the Timbers then go redeploy some of the resources that they didn't spend uh, this time around uh, on on a young DP in the summer or maybe in the winter, depending on how things go. They've got some flexibility in terms yeah, of timing Yeah, you have there. to assume that they and will. Obviously, you know, like the, the, if they're willing to, to spend that $15 million, you'd you'd have to think that that pot of 10, like a good portion of that will be used if they're successful, you know. I don't think it's safe to assume that they will, though. Well, not all, yeah, not, yeah but <laughs> because I know. I, I, think, I think it's safe to assume that they will try. That they will attempt to. <laughs> I don't think it's yes, safe to yes. assume that they will. Uh, because, you know, I mean, look, it, this is clearly not the signing that they were hoping to make, right? They had more, some more ambitious targets. We know that Hamron Ritterame was, was, was among those, uh, and that didn't pan out. Um, there were probably a few others sort of along the way. Uh, but but you know it, it ended up being cabecita i don't think you know i i don't think the expectation for him frankly is to be kind of a put the team on his back kind of guy i think the expectation for him is to score a lot of goals uh, and just to to score a lot of goals uh and and that's something that they need i think that's something that will be an important sort of part of the team and and uh and you know i i think he ticks a lot of those boxes but this is not the top top DP signing that that Phil Neville uh, was saying. This is not, you know, we're not clucking around kind of stuff that uh, that Mayor Paulson. This is, you know, sort of a, a fairly typical ordinary DP signing. Oh, um, good. Don't get me wrong. And 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 I think there are lots of reasons to think that this is probably among the safer types of DP signings. Oh, and definitely one of the more and important that, and, in recent years too. like, obviously Evander is a massive one, but, but if you think about the last yeah. like, three or four years, like this, this is up there, but it's not, it's not this like world ending, like Bertarame would have been so much money and, and a big splash sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it's good that they went for that, but yeah, this is obviously different. Look, Bertarame would, would have been sort of the timber trying to go out and get their own Cucho Hernandez, right. Uh, at Columbus, who's been unbelievable uh for for them and 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 would have been sort of that kind of sort of modern forward for them uh i think they they would love if cabecita came in and and sort of gave them cucho hernandez type uh type quality i think it's probably a little bit of an unrealistic unrealistic expectation uh in terms of uh of what he's going to provide uh but you know i mean i i think they want him to be a 15 goal scorer and and that's that would be good. That would be a real addition to this team. Uh, and especially if, if he sort of maintains an avenue to keeping Felipe Mora on the field with some regularity, if he can get and stay healthy, uh, I think all of those things make sense. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think the, the signing makes a lot of sense, uh, given how the Timbers set their ambitions for the off season, there's undoubtedly a twinge of disappointment. Uh, and and that's just kind of how it is. But we, I mean, we sort of talked a yeah. lot about this last week, so I don't yeah, think expectation we need to go fully is, back is over a topic again. That, that a lot of people in the soccer community talk about. And, you know, it, it matters, but at the end of the day, it is sort of part of the noise, right? It's it's the same thing as like media pundits going out and talking all this this flack or this this positivity. Either way, people like us, like it, we're, we are, we yeah, are that's right. in many ways part of the noise, but also <laughs> yeah. that sort of talk, you know, per- in every way, part of the noise. We're yeah, literally we're, making noise right now. We, we it, it is a podcast. That's all we. I guess we do have a visual. Yeah, we do. We now, are but, YouTube stars. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's right. I influencers never call me that again. 
No, 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 no. You're getting worse. Cold, Much worse. Cold. Okay. Uh, TikTok <laughs> might get banned, so this could be our only only shot here. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, look, a big big signing for the Timbers. Uh, he should probably be re. He should probably be integrated uh, in the next few weeks, depending on how Visa stuff goes for him. Sure, yeah, it should happen pretty too. quickly. I, I would imagine they're they're working overtime to make sure he gets here as soon as possible. Um, they've done well yep. with with Dyrone in there as sort of the the striker, but uh, they they obviously are very excited to bring in somebody of Cabecita's caliber. Um, and and looking forward to to people getting to know him too as as somebody that could be a, a major addition to the the soccer community. Look, the guy, you know, in terms of notoriety if we're talking about social media and influencers and whatever, the guy has like 600,000 Instagram followers like that, that dwarfs anybody hey. on, on the timbers right now. <laughs> like, like Evander, I think has like 125 or whatever, not to like compare like that. That's some sort of not to compare, but, but actually to, but to, compare. to compare. Yeah. Like it, it does not matter. <laughs> it's a social utility that means nothing other than maybe like, you know, advertising dollars, but it's a big deal. Right. Like he's, oh, he's yeah. a well-known guy. So, it's exciting. He's he he's 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 a well known guy. Yeah, see, these are all the facts that you have that I just I I don't <laughs> have these facts. Instagram. What an app. Uh so so the Thorns play Saturday and um they and do. it's it's a very big season for that team. Obviously the Bethals take over in ownership. Um major additions, including Jesse Fleming in the midfield being the highlight, um, Canada national team star and somebody that that Plugging in with Sam Coffey uh, is is going to be a legit NWSL player for for the Portland Thorns, who you know they open up on the road in KC uh, and and have a, a challenging schedule is is an inevitability when it comes to the NWSL. Uh, but it's a big year for the league. It's a big year for the Thorns. Obviously, the ownership change is a big thing, but new TV deal, more exposure. Um, Big year in terms of, as we've talked about many times before, uh, trying to re-sign Sophia Smith, which Karina LeBlanc yesterday, uh, Fouke Wynn was was reporting this, uh, said that the contract talks are ongoing. Um, that is news because it's them acknowledging that they're, the the talks are ongoing, but I've sort of been under the assumption that those talks have been ongoing for, I mean, for a while would have been a scandal. If, if they haven't been, I mean, that that's a dereliction of duty. They, they are working towards this and obviously the thorns want to make this happen. The question is, is does self want to make this happen? And, um, you know, the, those questions will be asked throughout the season and that's a big focus, but, um, you, you look at this team, obviously on paper, one of the most talented in the league, um, good chance to, to, get in there at the end and, and get another championship if they stay healthy and things go right for them this year. Um, we've talked about the starting 11 before. N- not a lot of comparisons. There are great teams around the league and there are teams that are deeper than the thorns in all likelihood, but h- how could you argue with that starting 11? And, um, you know, I think the way you argue with the starting 11 is by saying it's an Olympic year and injuries and that yeah, kind of stuff happens it's inevitable right that's that's how you argue with it because i i agree with you this is this is a starting 11 that can compete with any team in nwsl it's really good oh back to front it's 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 really good less slightly less good in back than it is in front but it's in front it's really good oh um, so you know I, I i think this is a starting 11 that that can compete for championships I think it's a total black box after that. <laughs> I think it's it's a I mean they have a number of wild cards. It's a it's a combination of some sort of fringe international signings and by fringe I, I don't mean like, you know, it, it it's not like these are sort of established national teamers coming in to provide depth. That would be crazy, but it's not like that's the situation. I mean these are are, are folks who are sort of like second tier uh international signings. Uh, some draft picks, uh, some fairly deep depth holdovers from uh, from last year, uh, and 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 a, a couple of vets. And, and so, I mean, after that eleven, I I think that's where the questions begin. And frankly, I think in many ways that's going to dictate how the Thorns do over the course of a season because you can't 
you can't win a shield. You can't win a championship with 11. You just can't. The other big question, I think, is the goalkeeping situation. Uh, and not so much necessarily from just the, does Shelby Hogan have the talent to be a number one in the NWSL? I think we've probably seen enough to say, yeah, yeah probably. Um, but, I mean, let's not underrate. I mean, I, the, I think they actually just made the hire, and I'm being completely unprepared. I don't have the name in front of me. Oh, um, uh, Ryan in, in this moment is going to the internet to, uh, to, to cover for my lack of preparation. Oh, um, but look, I mean, losing to Dean Onger, who for my money was a runaway best goalkeeping coach in M- NWSL for several years. Yeah. Is significant. And the new, the new person in that job is Jordan Franken as the goalkeeper coach joining Mike Norris's staff. Uh, he comes from Australia. He was the goalkeeper coach for the U 23s and U 20 Australian national teams, goalkeeper coach for Melbourne city FC in the A league. So he, he comes in to, to fill massive boots in, uh, in Nadine Anger. Yeah. Nadine Anger is one of the greatest goalkeepers, probably the greatest yeah. goalkeeper of all time. She won the Bayonne d'Or as a goalkeeper. Yeah, pretty for crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and she was maybe every bit as good as a goalkeeping coach and developing multiple goalkeepers for the Thorns as she was as a player. So, I mean, that's a, those are big boots to fill. Uh, and, and they're going to have to do it. And, and that matters. Uh, so I think that's where the questions are for the thorns uh, in terms of on the field this year. And and I think be, those questions create a really broad spectrum of possible outcomes for the thorns this year. I mean, I could very easily say, I would, I, I will go so far as to say, I will not be surprised if the thorns win a title. I also won't be surprised if the thorns miss. That's how out. tight it is in the league too, honestly. It's yeah, how the- tight it is in the league, but it's also just like, I mean, this could be a very good Thorns team, or this could be not a very good Thorns team at all. Yeah, it, it's more up in the air, I think, than it's than it's been in recent years, just because of the because of the losses, because of the the depth being a potential question. Now, all we could be totally wrong. All of these players, the these young additions from the international stage to the rookies to everybody else, could come in and just be world beaters, and you know, people like us will be you know bulletin board material. <laughs> Or, or you know, not even world beaters, but yeah, solid and that's, contrib- that's all they need. If they're solid contributors, then you're looking at the Thorns roster and you're like, oh, holy yeah, smokes. Because look at the starting 11. <laughs> look they're at the good starting Andy. 11. It's Sophia Smith, Morgan Weaver, Hina Sugita, Olivia Moultrie, Sam Coffey, Jesse Fleming, Becky Sauerbrunn, Kelly Hubley, Megan Klingenberg, Raina Reyes, Shelby Hogan. That That's... That that'll oh, freaking boy. play, right? And 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 Fleming is somebody that you know. You talk about having multiple MVP candidates on the team last year in Smith, Coffee, and Weaver, who should not by any means be a discounted. She she on any other team would be leading the team in goals and just you know blowing the world up. But she's on a great team with other great attacking players. You add Fleming to that mix, she's another person that can be an, an NWSL MVP caliber player. And that is nothing to sneeze at. It, the questions that we that we are posing here are obvious. It's like the inevitable couple of injuries, and then so what happens after that? You know. And how many of those players are going to be yeah. gone for the Olympics? Yeah, the Olympics Certainly is a Sophia big Smith. stretch. Certainly yeah. now, Sam Coffey. I mean, that's that's one of the things that we we learned these the, these last couple of weeks with the Gold Cup is Sam Coffey is going to yeah. be in the national team. Period. That that's that's over and done. She was one of their best players in the final. Uh, she got three straight starts to close that tournament. Uh, and she plays she's great. Too. She has deservedly made her way into the team. She's going to be gone. Becky Sauerbrunn might not be. She Becky Sauerbrunn might might stay. But Jesse Fleming gone. Janine Becky probably going to be gone. Uh, I mean, you can sort of go down the list in terms of who's going to be taken off for the Olympics. Number yeah, of folks. it'll be good for them to get Janine back too. In general, that's that's a player that. You know, given she was out all of last year, probably their first yeah. player off the bench, assuming she can. Yeah. Get and somebody healthy. that can start when when he is out of town or injured or if if Weaver is is getting opportunities at the national team level or injured. I think that that Weaver is definitely deserving of more of those sort of looks uh, with the national team. But um, but yeah, I mean, Be- Becky, Becky is is a depth piece that you can feel good about. Right. Coming off of that injury, she's she's 
she's raring to go. She she <laughs> worked so hard to get back and uh, is is one of the more important pers- locker room personalities for that team on top of obviously being an important player. Yep. And and then they're quite, you know, how, how does Marie Moeller come in? How, you know, I mean, there are those sorts of questions that I think are going to dictate how they do through that period, but they're going to lose a, a, a lot of players for the Olympics uh, and, and various international absences. And then when you have a major tournament and the thorns felt this deeply last year, when you have a major tournament like that, and the Olympics is, is shorter than the world cup, but a really grueling tournament because they basically sandwich an entire tournament. I mean, the Olympics are not that long. They're like, 17 days or something like that uh they basically sandwich a month-long tournament into about three weeks and that's i mean it's a physically taxing tournament with and this is just absurd i mean this is just like blows my mind uh the ioc has to like like wake up 18 player rosters (laughs) it's just yeah so that creates the uncertainty too of like if a national team player gets hurt (laughs) you suddenly just want one of your most important players left gets plucked and then you're you're sol you know yeah and and even then even if they don't get hurt you know crystal dungan didn't get hurt at the world cup last year but she was a shell of the player that she was beforehand when she came back and that's understandable like it's a really physically emotionally mentally taxing tournament and it's hard to come back in and immediately get stuck back into a playoff race and into a shield and on top of that there's an announcement yesterday that and this might affect the thorns. It might not. The thorns would be a, a nice draw for this tournament, but there's a, there's a conca champions for the, for the women's side now. And that's starting this summer. <laughs> I, I believe it's this summer. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. And, and so like uh, the, the, the super league that's been, that's been discussed, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, there are all of the, all of those things, all of those factors that I think create a lot of uncertainty for the thorns on the field this year. But I don't think the on-field stuff is the most important thing for the Thorns this year. <laughs> I think that, I mean, it, very weirdly, I think the on-field stuff is in some respects a, you know, 1A level story uh, for the Thorns this year. It's the off-field stuff that matters. Because if the Thorns win the NWS, win the title and Sophia Smith doesn't resign, and they don't make progress on a training facility, and they don't sort of make infrastructural progress in the club, the club would be further set back than if they missed the playoffs but did sign with Sophia Smith and didn't make progress on, on these infrastructural right. issues. Right, like there's, the there's a lot to be right. said about the, the past success of the Thorns and the culture that they have built in that locker room and the culture of success that they have developed despite everything swirling around them over the years. But... This is a moment in the history of the NWSL that the Portland Thorns need to to capture. They need to to ride that wave and and be one of the leaders in the league in all facets if they want to to continue to have that success on the field in the future. To borrow really unfortunate nomenclature from the MLS side, I mean it, the Thorns sort of dominated NWSL 1.0. Uh, I think along on the field along with the North Carolina Courage, they were the best on the field. Off the field, leagues ahead of basically the rest of the league. But we're in NWSL 2.0 now. Uh, That much has been made clear over the course of the last couple of years. Kansas City Stadium, which will be opening up this weekend, is good evidence of that. Everything that we see down in San Diego, everything that we see at Angel City, uh, the increased ambition that we that we're starting to see across Utah the league. for all of its organizational questions, they're coming in to the league with a major training facility. Yeah, I think, and and I think Bay FC is is going to be sort of uh, resetting expectations, and 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 I mean, all of those kinds of things suggest, and not just suggest, but establish that this is going to be sort of the the next era. To borrow some nomenclature now from Taylor Swift uh of of nwsl and i think the thorns place in that era is genuinely uncertain will they continue to be sort of at a league leading level in terms of uh of pushing things forward as a club in terms of on the field success in ter- uh, of all of those things certainly the bethals have said that that is their intent but intent and 
doing. Yeah, and different it's things. hard to take over and, at and this, that is the at question this time season. period too, right? Like the timing of the sale, <laughs> one could argue, given the challenges of, of navigating this space and riding that wave, the timing of the sale, you could argue, could probably not be worse for the Bethals to, 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 unless they had, had done a lot of the groundwork before, which I assume they, they have done a great deal behind the scenes. Um, you know, building those connections you, you and, know, when, and becoming that sort of league level presence that, yeah, like, like if you look back, there were obviously the the major issues off the field with Merritt Paulson and Gavin Wilkinson that led to, to them being completely separate from from the thorns now but they were two individuals who on the league level and on a scouting and talent acquisition level did a lot of work to make the thorns what they were and and merit like he there were a lot of inequities and challenges that the thorns faced under his ownership but the impetus is now on this new ownership group and the Bethals to to throw their weight around at the league level in the way that he did and well beyond. Because that that's honestly that's what's necessary at this point. And for a long time the Thorns were also an economic powerhouse, just way over and above what any other. Yeah, team and the attendance was. is a huge part of that, obviously. I mean, there's a, there's a, just a huge economic difference from having a a built-in stadium that your club already has control over and b when you're bringing 15 20 000 to games when the rest of the league is bringing four or five thousand that's a huge economic difference <laughs> and 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 that sort of allowed the thorns to be separated from the pack for a long time because they just i mean it was they were playing on a in a in a different league uh, in many respects, as so many other teams, but that's just not the case anymore. That the, it doesn't make the Thorns unique that they're drawing fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand of games. There are multiple other teams in the league doing that now, and so the question becomes, you know, what what the Bethal family is going to be able to do to kind of build out the organization on that side of things. And I agree with you. You know, I mean, a I think their ability to sort of pre build out was probably very limited. Obviously you can't really make those kinds of investments before you agree to a contract and, and executory periods are, are usually short enough that that doesn't really give you a meaningful chance uh, to do so either. Cause you know, I mean, it's a matter of a month or six weeks or something like that. We don't know. Uh, but you know, I mean, that's just not enough time and it would be great in an ideal world if the Bethalus could sort of step in and have kind of a six month honeymoon period of like, you know, getting uh, their feet under them, building out their club, building out the organization before they needed to get off and running. But that's not the luxury that they have. And so, you know, I mean, they've, they are in a really challenging position uh, because there's a lot that needs to happen. <laughs> there's a lot that needs to happen now. Uh, and it's, it's unfair in some respects, but that's just where, you know, you, you, you come to the club as it is, not as you would yeah. like it to be. And, and, and that, that's the position that they're in. And so I think those are going to be the things that are going to determine whether 2024 is a success for the Thorns. Um, I think, you know, I don't want to go so far as to say the on-field stuff is secondary because, frankly, I think the on-field stuff affects these things. Totally interwoven. I mean, if yeah, the Thorns it's, are winning. It's, it's impossible to separate yeah, those two things. It's going to be a lot easier to re-sign Sophia Smith if the Thorns are winning and everybody's sort of, you know, and 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 everybody is pulling in the same direction, and it's a super tight knit group, right? Oh, that'll be a lot easier than if they're struggling, if they're strife in the locker room. If you know, I mean, all of those things will make that a lot more challenging. But for me, in terms of assessing what happens in twenty twenty four for this club, I think the off field stuff in the end is going to be what sets the thorns up for this next era, uh, for for NWSL's new era than uh than you know whether where they finish in on the and in, in terms of the on-field stuff like you know we've talked about the starting 11 we've talked about the depth and everything um in, in terms of mike norris's tactical approach in terms of the way that they might play now given the personnel given their ability to to sort of flex fleming and, and coffee as as the double pivot and um and continue to utilize smith in isolated spaces where she can just 
destroy and and annihilate and do everything that all the superlatives that we have talked about so repeatedly uh, the speed and playmaking ability of of Weaver and Sagita on the wings I mean what what do you envision in terms of how this Thorns team will play and maybe the issues that they might face that either Mike Norris will sort of dial certain things and correct this year you you think about their defending on the edges as sort of an issue they had a little bit last year. Um, what what bounces around in your head in that regard? So I think the thing that Norris has struggled with and struggled with last year was central midfield balance, and I think that is a question again this year. Um, I I think I th- I I think there are ways to get it right, but. They're going to need to figure it out, right? Uh, I, you know, Sam Coffey is going to be their six. You can put that in pin. Every game that she is available, she is going to start in that spot, period. Easy selection. Uh, I think the dynamic actually between Moultrie, who I su- assume is going to start in central midfield most of the time, and Fleming is going to be interesting. And how they work that out is going to be, uh, is going to be a, a, a real question. Uh, I think in I think Fleming fits really well as an eight, and if she can commit and Norris wants her to commit fully to that role, that makes the most sense to me. I don't think Olivia Moultrie is an eight. I think she's going to be more of a ten, uh, and uh, and because her, I mean, Olivia Moultrie is a very honest player, but she doesn't bring the sort of defensive presence that say a Rocky Rodriguez did, right? Uh, the two-way presence that that somebody like Rocky did. And I think that's what they need to fill. And so that is a question that I think they need to get right. How the Thorns defend when they're in possession. Because this team, you know, I think this team is set up best to be a really effective, pretty direct team. Sophia Smith, everybody talks about her speed that misses her best attribute. She's the best hold-up player in America. She's one of the best hold-up players in the world. She is unbelievable. She's so strong. physical. It's it's crazy like for for her height and size like she is she's one of the most physical players in she, the world. She she wrecks central defenders to whom she gives up 20 pounds, 30 pounds and 6 inches. <laughs> wrecks them. Um uh, and it's be- and and you know, in, when you have that, and she also, I don't know if you've seen, can score some goals. Um, it, when you have that, you're generally going to say, okay, I want to be a little bit more direct, right? Because uh, because I want to play through my forward, move my wingers off of her, and then get Soph in, into the box to, to finish the play. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense if teams let them play that way. My hunch is that there are going to be a lot of teams that are going to want the Thorns to possess and are going to invite, especially at Providence Park, are going to invite the Thorns to possess. And I think that's going to be the moments in which we have yet to see answers. Not that I don't think they can score goals when they possess. I think they can. But the question is going to be how they defend when they're in possession. It's going to be the rest defense. Uh, and how well they're sort of able to to keep control of games. Because when we've seen the Thorns struggle at Providence Park, we've very rarely seen them be overrun. When we've seen them struggle, when the San Diegos of the world have caused the Thorns problems at Providence Park, oftentimes they've had a lot of pretty inert yeah, possession. The Thorns like thrive in that. And then they, yeah, and they, then they thrive they in hit. the chaos. They thrive in just the the throwing a million things at the wall, and several of them are going to stick because they have those right. players. And frankly, I think a lot of teams are going to say, you know what, we are like, God forbid, we allow Sophia Smith to get into a circumstance in which she's one-on-one versus one of our central defenders. We're not going to let that happen in any phase of the game, whether it's, whether it's in, the, in the center circle or in the six-yard box. We are not going to let Sophia Smith go one-on-one against any of our central defenders because we know how that's going to go, right? She's going to wreck them because that's what she does. Sophia freaking Smith. That's what she does. And, and so we're not going to let that happen ever. Which means we're gonna we're gonna keep things pretty tight. Uh, we're gonna let the thorns carry a lot of the ball, and we're gonna challenge them to break us down. And uh, I think those are are sort of the that it's that kind of game model that I don't yet know if they have the right personnel, 
uh, and if they have the right tactical approach to handle. You know, unfortunately, because of, because of the way this this preseason has played out with no sort of Challenge Cup, no, I mean, there was like like that one stream that weirdly ended like 20 minutes early and... That was such a uh, disaster. To... <laughs> and was just like like interviews with just like a game oh going on God, in the background. That... Uh, we, we know next to nothing about how this season is is setting up, right? Because there's there's meaningfully from a fan's perspective been no preseason. preseason. So <laughs> that's why like this regular season feels kind of jarring. You're like, no, oh, holy crud, they play this week. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of that, but I, I think that is going to be the biggest question it, aside from just the obvious personnel depth questions. I mean, what if Sophia Smith gets hurt again? Who is that backup number nine? Yeah. Previously it was Hannah Bedford. She's in Utah now, you know, who, who is going to be that? Is Izzy Dequilla going to step in <laughs> to, to that role? Do they move Morgan Weaver over? I, I, I genuinely don't know. A lot of questions for sure. Uh, a lot of questions when you when you start going through those kinds of scenarios. There are a lot of questions that we don't have certain answers for to. sure. And you know, we look forward to to seeing as much media coverage of that team as possible this season. Obviously, you know, the Oregonian and Oregon Live are, are partnering with the I five corridor for coverage of the Timbers and Thorns. So, um, you know, yeah, Tyson's yeah, Tyson. gonna be out there. Shane Hoffman will be out there. Um, you know, doing doing what they can to cover both teams and. Yeah, from from others that are in that space to Taylor Vincent, Fook Win, uh, all of the people around that uh, that team. Um, I look forward to seeing and reading as much coverage as possible this season because I think that team deserves it, and and it, it deserves you know thorough media coverage from professional outlets, from people who do it because it's fun. <laughs> I mean, this this is all this is all important stuff here. Soccer enthusiasts, Soccer enthusiasts like it says it right below him uh, on, on the YouTube. That's right. <laughs> um, so 10 a.m. Saturday is that game for the Thorns against Kansas City. That's 10 a.m. Pacific uh, at CPKC Stadium, the brand new women's soccer specific stadium for the KC Current. Obviously, there's a little rivalry there with the, the matchup in the championship a couple of years ago. Um, an exciting first opponent and first setting for the Thorns. That game's going to be broadcast on ABC and ESPN Deportes and ESPN Plus National TV Thornies on Saturday. I I don't even know what time it's going to be for me. I'm going to be in South Korea at that point. Um but I uh, I will do my darndest to to get a look at the first Thorns game. Um but in terms of our podcast, uh probably won't hear for us for, from us for the next couple of weeks as I as I depart to Asia. But we will be watching closely as the Timbers and Thorns continue their seasons. We appreciate everybody that's still listening to the podcast and, and responding to us and providing reviews and tweeting at us and everything else. Um, we'll, we'll see some Timbers fans in, or I'll see some Timbers fans along with my brother uh, in, in Tokyo for, for that game uh, at, uh, at PDX tap room. So we'll, we'll see y'all out there. If there's anybody that actually like is a, is, a listener out there please let me know that will be the coolest thing ever to to run into people that listen to this pod um but but you can you know like us subscribe to us wherever you get your pods follow us on twitter at soccer maiden pdx ryan t clark chris reifer um and we will see you next time